OpenAPI is a way to describe your HTTP API, but it only comes from one side of the spectrum, which is design time, meaning when you're developing and writing code. So as a developer, if I'm gonna use this API, I can see all the operations I can make, the requests, the responses, and this is helpful for me when I'm actually writing code and building my app at design time. But at the other end of the spectrum is runtime, and that's more dynamic in nature, and that's often when you hear things about hypermedia. And you can use both. You can use OpenAPI with Hypermedia. They're not mutually exclusive. I'm gonna illustrate this. So along the way, if you're unfamiliar with what it is, you'll get the gist of it. But it's not an and or, and it's not either you have to be doing one full blown or the other full blown. You can actually use both in tandem and sprinkle Hypermedia in. Here's how. Before I jump into my example and demo, I'd like to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. So if for every HTTP method you have against a path, that's ultimately an operation in OpenAPI, and you can have an optional operation ID. So if we look back at the Swagger UI here, we can see we have all these operations, but where's the operation ID? If I jump into our ASP.NET Core startup in the use Swagger UI, I can actually use the display operation ID, which will show it to us. Now you can see on the right-hand side, these are all the operation IDs. Now these are based on the unique names of the routes that I've defined. In my controllers, you can do the same thing in minimal APIs. That's all you need to do with OpenAPI. Now we can start sprinkling in some hypermedia in our HTTP API. But why and how? Let's keep going. So in this demo app, I'm logged in as admin, and when I went to this users list, the first thing I actually noticed was, for this particular user, Terry Smith, which is who I'm logged in as, as admin, I can't actually, I can view the record, but I can't actually edit or remove it. And that's because of this logic right here that only lets you do an edit or delete if you're not an admin. It also has similar logic if you actually do try to perform the edit or the delete that it returns an error if you are the admin. Now, while this is a simple example, think about your own system. And if you do this, where you have a logic that's in the UI dictating what the user can and cannot do, which you then have that same logic elsewhere to make sure that they actually don't do it. And of course things evolve, and that's kind of the point, is that what happens if we change our rules that on the back end in our HTTP API, we allow editing and deleting of that admin user. We now have client code that might not be what we're managing and developing. That could be somebody completely separate, some third party. How do they know that they can do this now? And that's the point of hypermedia and not being bound strictly to design time and coupling to those ideas, but tossing in things at runtime that can allow you to evolve. So the very first thing I'm gonna do in this code base is this user view model, which is used to return uh, an individual user from our HP API or a list of users. What it has is what I'm gonna to add to it is this list of operations. And then we have this operation view model, which has the operation ID, which now this may start to make sense, the URI and the method. If I look at the controller that's actually generating the response, so I'm building out my user view model, and now I'm moving the logic now to the server side saying, okay, if it's not the admin, then I'm providing operations that can be performed. So I'm saying that you can do update user, delete user. When I'm doing this, I'm using link generation built into ASP.NET Core based on the name of the route, which is ultimately that operation ID. So now when I jump back over to the Swagger UI, I'm gonna try out and execute our get users. So I can see my list of users and now I see those list of operations. So at design time, as me as a developer looking at this, I could see, okay, well, these are the possible operations that might occur, that might be returned to me. And I can look at that operation ID and I can say, okay, well, let me look at what it does so I can build my code to see that, oh, update user, this is how I execute it, this is how I call it. So what that means is that design time, I can write this type of code now saying, okay, well, if there is an operation ID of update user that's returned for that particular record for that row, then I'm gonna display it. Same thing with the delete user. I don't have logic in here determining whether they were admin or not. That's all determined on the server. Now I'm explicitly being told at runtime via the response what you can and cannot do. And that can evolve, that can change. But now we're handling this with our code at design time. So now we're kind of really mixing design and runtime. So looking at our client, it still has the same thing where we can't edit or delete if we're in an admin. But like I mentioned, things have evolved. So let's say on the server side, we decided we made some changes that you actually can allow to update the user. So if I apply this, 
Now, if I go and look at my record, it's reloaded. I actually can perform the edit here. So we not uh, do we don't have any coupling to that actual logic of the admin user, or any of the business rules you can think of in your system. We're being explicit in our responses about what you can and cannot do. This could be based on the state of the system, how your business rules change, but really your client doesn't need to understand any of that. It just needs to understand what operations might be possible and how to perform them. Now this is a really simple example, but I hope it gets the gist across about how you can do this because it's not a one or the other. It's not like you have to be doing full blown hypermedia all the way. You can kind of sprinkle it like this in and give your clients some information about what they can perform and make them more dynamic so you can evolve. There's nothing saying you can't be using open API and using the operation ID like this to give your clients the understanding at design time, what might be possible and how you make those requests. For me, it's about striking a balance and kind of finding where you land. It doesn't need to be one or the other. You can dabble in both. Hopefully this video cleared a little bit of the muddy water about hypermedia because it's really not that complicated and how you can just simply use the operation ID as a way to distinguish at design time what you might be able to call from your clients. If you enjoyed a video like this about hypermedia or event-driven architecture, event sourcing, etc., anything related to software architecture and design, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server. Check the link in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.